So many people believe that any diet works and makes you healthy if you eat less, right? We've all been told eat less, exercise more. This eating less concept have, has resulted in many individuals believing that eating is bad for you, right? It's created this distorted vision in our mind. And actually, we have to recognize that eating is important, right? We need fuel. There are certain fuels that are better than others. And that's what we all in this room are here because we know that what we eat is going to change our bodies and it can change it for the better. So I'm gonna share with you all the basics so we're on the starting page at the same place for all the subsequent speakers. Now, the other thing to know is if your waistline has ever started to increase or you've had a weight loss problem where you've gained weight, lost weight, regained weight, right? If you've had fatigue after you're eating, if you feel like you're, you've been told your blood pressure is high, your sugars are high, you have prediabetes, diabetes, you have high triglycerides, bad cholesterol, good cholesterol, all sorts of things, and you've been offered medications, this day is for you, okay? Because we all know better, and we know that we can actually support great health. So this is the outline for today. We're gonna to talk about why weight matters and really about weight and insulin. <coughs> we're going to use nutrition for health. And again, this is where we're gonna go this whole day. So what's the goal? Every patient that comes to my office, we ask, what's your goal? And almost everybody has something about health, right? They wanna be healthy. So what does that mean? I think about this picture, right? When you're like that child, every one of us has been there where we felt like the superhero and we were on top of the world and nothing could stop us. That's what we want, to feel good, be independent with no limits, have the freedom to live the life you want and optimize your quality of life, have a disability-free years and life after retirement. And so even after that age, we still wanna feel that way, right? As we get older still, we still wanna feel that way. It's not changed. Our health goals are still the same. And it doesn't matter how old we are, we still want to feel good, be independent, and have the freedom to live the life that we want. So we have to start out first with a little bit of um, terminology so that we all understand. The CDC, or the Centers for Disease Control, defines BMI. We've all heard about the term BMI, body mass index, and it has to do with the ratio of your weight and your height and in medicine, we like to categorize things and give things names, okay? So based on a BMI of an individual, we categorize things and we say a BMI less than 18.5 is underweight BMI. A normal weight BMI is considered 18.5 to 24.9. And above a BMI of 25, that's considered overweight or obese. And that's a diagnosis, it's a, it's a term. Now, we know BMI is not perfect, right? Because bodybuilders who I take care of, I can't pinch any fat off their body, but their BMI might put them at overweight or obese, right? Somebody might have a normal BMI, but they have no muscle mass on their body and they're very unhealthy, okay? So, but what we do know is no matter what your BMI is, no matter who you are, Healthy nutrition, physical activity, and healthy lifestyle behaviors makes a difference, right? It's recommended for everybody. Now, for overweight and obese, that's 71.6% of the population. And that's a majority of the patients that come to my clinic. And in that category, they get referred to me and BMI is used to also talk about other options for treatment. So a lot of people are used to just getting medications when they go to a doctor's office, right? A BMI of 27 and above, I can give them medications to help them lose weight. Or 35 and above, they can go for bariatric or metabolic surgery. But there's other options too, and that's why they come to our clinic, because they wanna learn about the nutrition, physical activity, and behaviors that can help them with all of this. 
So why does BMI matter? If it's not perfect, why do we even use it? Well, it's pretty easy to measure. And actually, it's been used in research. That's where it first started. And so BMI, you'll see across the bottom here, oh, I've got to switch pointers here, okay? Across the bottom here, these are the BMIs, and you see they're increasing. And up this axis, this is called the mortality ratio. And what this shows you is a mortality ratio of one means for every time we expect one death, there's one death. So it's exactly what you would expect, all right? And if the BMI is increasing, you see the mortality ratio increases. So a mortality ratio of two means in that population, we might expect one death, but there's actually two occurring in somebody with this higher BMI. So that's why BMI has become a thing in medicine, okay? So, now, a lot of um, people will say, well, people aren't really trying. They should really try to lose weight. They should try to take care of themselves better. And we all get blamed for not doing a good job with that, right? But actually, 50% of people are trying to lose weight at any one time. That's a lot. People spend $60 billion of their own money to try and do this in a year. And this was many years ago, okay? So the numbers are even higher. It costs the United States $215 billion in 2011. Imagine now it's much higher because of death, disability, inability to work, medication costs, etc. In the world, one in 20 deaths are related to obesity. That's pretty significant. Now what they're saying is at the rate that obesity is increasing in, this, in the globe, by 2030, about half of all adults will be overweight or obese. One in two, okay, around the world. Now, the frightening number for me is 41 million U.S. children under the age of five are overweight or obese. 41 million, under five, all right? So we can make a difference for sure. All right, there we go. We know that increased weight leads to increased health problems and type two diabetes, high cholesterol or dyslipidemia, increased cancer risk, mood disorders, heart disease, reproductive disorders, liver disease, high blood pressure, hypertension. It costs a lot of money, takes up a lot of time and a lot of emotional energy for any of these chronic conditions, and they're all related to excess weight. Of the top five causes of death in the United States, you'll see at the bottom, oops, sorry about this uh, formatting. So it's heart disease, cancers is the second bar, chronic lower respiratory disease or lung disease, accidents and stroke, are across the bottom, and the height of those bars tells you how many deaths there are for each of those categories. And what you're gonna see is that there's these blue bars. The blue bars show you the numbers of those deaths that were potentially preventable. That's a lot. If you look at heart disease, it's higher than this middle one is lung disease. It's higher than all lung disease deaths could be prevented, all right? So this is the area where we get to make a difference because what we've been doing hasn't been working in the past.